Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Way T Lightheart with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast from Bioptimizers. And today we're going to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. It's the importance of eating organic. Plus, we're going to talk specifically about some chemical agents like Roundup and, and, and genetically modified organisms, GMOs, oftentimes. Um, we're going to talk about what's the problem with those, what the damage they're doing, particularly to our digestive system, as well as a variety of other systems in the body. And we're going to talk about the threat of genetically engineered microbes and their relationship uh, to humanity, to what potentially could be something related to the pandemic, as well as some other issues that are coming up. I don't know if you know, it's a big topic out there. There are genetically modified organisms and chemical agents. Uh, and if anyone's heard my rants on food production and distribution, you'll know this is something that's very important. And today's guest is Jeffrey Smith, and he has been a leading spokesperson, spokesperson on the GMO health dangers for a long time, about 25 years. And he's authored two global bestsellers, directed five films, delivered a thousand lectures and a thousand interviews in 45 countries, trained 1,500 speakers, speakers and organized 10,000 grassroots advocates. He is now sounding the alarm about the serious, even irreversible hazards from new genetic engineering techniques, which can lead to health and environmental catastrophes. Jeffrey leads Protect Nature. Now, there it is here. So, Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here, Wade. Well, let's kind of get, I want to go back a little bit organic, like organically, if you will, starting your careers, which is, which is long and storied in this uh, advocacy, uh, which you're putting forward. How did that originate? What, where was the background story that got you turned on to the dangers of genetic food, genetic modification, um, and the potential dangers and what seems to be the implicit dangers that are around these products? Well, in 1996, I went to a lecture by a genetic engineer whistleblower. He was an expert at the process of genetic engineering. He was doing cancer research and was aware that Monsanto was about to plant commercialized genetically engineered soybeans and corn and canola in the United States that will get into our food supply. And he said, knowing what he knew about genetic engineering, there is no way that they can do it in a predictable and safe manner. They were most definitely risking the health of the human population, and moreover, because once you put these in the ground, they can cross-pollinate and contaminate the gene pool for as long as that species exists, essentially irreversibly. So when I heard about this, I was a chronic do-gooder. I was into marketing and education and uh, strategy, and I figured I would just chip in with a little bit of, a, of help to try and get the information, you know, messaged in the right way, delivered to the right person, and I started watching the news feeds around the world about GMOs, and very few people were focusing on the health dangers. Most of the nonprofits were focused on the environmental dangers or the pro problems with farmers not able to save seeds or patenting life. But I saw that there were substantial potential problems with health and that no one was focusing on it beyond three or four sentences. So I started interviewing scientists and doctors, wrote Seeds of Deception. It became the world's best-selling book on GMOs. And before I knew it, I was traveling six to nine months a year for 13 years straight. So what are some of the dangers from these genetically altered foods? And, you know, I'm from Canada and there was a landmark case up there where Monsanto was suing farmers, multi-generational farmers for having their genetic seeds in their crop, which had been blown over from the uh, farmers fields that they were producing genetically modified foods. in, and uh, it was, it was seemed so uh, crazy that these farmers could be penalized for carrying these uh, or charged in, in, a, in a court case for carrying seeds that they didn't have any uh, indirect connection to and bear the consequence of that. What's the dangers? Why is this so important? And why are people avoiding the conversation? Most GMOs are designed to be sprayed with Roundup. Monsanto's 
Roundup herbicide is driven by the chief poison glyphosate. It was going off patent in year 2000, so they created Roundup Ready crops so that farmers would buy the Roundup Ready seeds and sign a contract that they would only buy Monsanto's version of Roundup or glyphosate-based herbicides. And the, when the farmers did plant the Roundup Ready seeds, you could spray Roundup right over the top of the crops and it would get absorbed into the crops and it would kill all the other weeds. And it, was, it made weeding very easy, but it then took a new toxin and added it to genetic engineering. So you have genetic engineering, which is inherently unsafe, creates massive collateral damage to the DNA, could create allergens or toxins or anti-nutrients or carcinogens. And then you have the Roundup, which is absorbed into the crop. And then you have whatever new protein is engineered to be created. So there's corn and cotton and soybeans that are engineered to produce an insecticide to kill insects. So you have a number of toxins and potential toxins in the mix. When you look at people who switch to non-GMO foods, and we have, I've asked at 150 lectures, what did people notice, including more than two dozen medical conferences, what did your patients notice? And it was an overwhelming response. So many people got better from chronic issues. And we decided to survey. And we surveyed 3,256 people. They got better from the same 28 different conditions, starting with the number one most popular, always digestive disorders, then energy, then weight problems, and brain fog, anxiety and depression, um, food sensitivities and allergies. And we're still above 50% of the people responding saying that they showed improvements. But virtually most of the chronic illnesses, from diabetes, numerous cancers, infertility, Alzheimer's, high blood pressure, skin conditions. And the average American eats their weight, more than their weight, in GMOs each year. So if it's a problem, you would probably see it in national statistics. And if you track about 30 or 35 different diseases or conditions, the rise in those conditions is followed in a parallel fashion by the percentage of GMO soy and corn planted in the U.S. or the amount of Roundup sprayed on soy and corn. Now, we also see that when dogs and cats and livestock switched from GMO food to non-GMO food, they get better from those different diseases or their precursors. When animal feeding studies force feed GMOs or Roundup to the lab animals, they suffer from similar diseases or their precursors. And now that we understand more of the modes of action, we could link why, for example, Roundup may lead to ADHD or insomnia or high blood pressure or autism or diabetes. We can understand the modes of action. It turns out that Roundup, and when we have this stew of toxins, the GMOs, the Roundup, and we know they both contribute to serious problems. But the Roundup alone has been better characterized in terms of its modes of action, and it damages the fundamentals of our health, our ability to absorb minerals, the, it creates leaky gut, damages the microbiome, damages the mitochondria, can prevent the production of serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine, can mess up chemicals, can cause intercellular lack of communication, all sorts of things we now understand just from the Roundup, let alone adding to that the GMOs, and in some cases, the built-in insecticide. The father of modern medicine, uh, Hippocrates, once is reported to say, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And it seems like we're living in this kind of strange world where poisons have become our medicines and poisons have become our food therefore resulting in an advancement of what I would say, uh, compromised health. So if we look at what the New England Journal of Medicine uh, issued, I think in, uh, it was during the Bush administration of Professor Oshansky that the life expectancy of are the children was going downwards. And that was edited by the White House, edited what his dire predictions were. But take that aside, the disability adjusted life expectancy was 60 years old in that book. And I think even though 
you know, people will say, well, life expectancy is 80 years, which is now on the decline from the last year due to fentanyl use, particularly, which is um, wreaking havoc in the Midwest. Um, the, the question of these is like, OK. What are the what's causing the problems? How long does it take to reverse the problems? And I think a lot of people don't understand that Roundup is actually a. Uh, it's an, it's essentially, it's to take out microbes and we are essentially responsible. We need a, a good, healthy relationship with our, our biome inside our digestive system in order to function properly. So it, there's no distinction. Is that right? Between what microbes it kills. And then, then I want to get to the, I want to get to the toxin part of that part. And then I want to get to the genetic part next. I want to see the interrelation between the two as you see it. Beautiful. So let's start with the microbiome impacts. <clears throat> Unlike normal antibiotics, which kind of carpet bomb indiscriminately, glyphosate, the chief poison in Roundup, is known to cause death among the beneficial bacteria, but not among the pathogenics. So wow. lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, things that we want, certain bifidobacteria can lower inflammation, that gets wiped out. The salmonella, the Clostidium botulinum, the, the, uh, the negative E. coli, uh, these things, the clostridium, these can, these can resist death. Now, a friend of mine, Kieran Krishnan, took a, a model of the human gut called the Shime model and fed it uh, a microbiome from a three-year-old in Sweden who had never been uh, vaccinated, never received um, any antibiotics, was living in the rural area, so it was pretty pristine, and then fed food to this fake gut and then added Roundup. And then he watched what happened and he saw the short chain uh, uh, fatty acids go down. He saw the population uh, of beneficials go down. He saw the diversity go down. And I then went through the 28 different conditions that people reported getting better from when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic food. And I said, is there any justification simply from the microbiome alone that could lead to these outcomes? And every single one of them could be explained from a scientific standpoint. He explained that about 80% of all chronic diseases have their source in disruption of the microbiome. There's a programming in there. As you know, fecal transplants, you can take the fecal matter of one animal or human, put it in another, and all of a sudden it, what travels with it is its diabetes or its tendency to, to gain weight or to lose weight. It's a programming. You see, we outsource over 90% or about 90% of our daily metabolic functions to our microbiome. We can get away with only a measly 22,000 genes, less than earthworms, because we use the 3.5 million genes of the microbes living inside us. And that is co-evolved with us. And there's things that we can't do and we don't need to do because the microbiome does it for us. When we damage that microbiome, we set the stage for disease, and in some cases, long-term disease. So if it were just the microbiome, and that was the only thing, I mean, it was glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. It's mm -hmm. known as an antibiotic. If that's the only thing that it did, it would still have a long list of diseases associated with it. But it also damages the mitochondria, which has a long list of diseases. It also can create leaky gut. And a Harvard professor wrote an article saying all disease begins in the leaky gut. So all diseases can be related. And then it goes on. I mean, so much depends on our hormones. So much depends on our neurotransmitters. So much depends on our ability to absorb minerals. All of those, all of those are inhibited. So from the microbiome perspective to the ability to use zinc and cobalt, glyphosate is a, was originally patented as a chelator to descale industrial boilers and pipes. In other words, as a chelator, it grabbed onto the minerals that were deposited along the pipes to pull them out. It grabs onto minerals and makes them unusable. So when we have glyphosate in our food supply, and glyphosate is not just in GMOs, but we'll talk about that, how it's also in grains and beans and in wine and beer, etc., it can render our internal minerals unavailable, in which case the biochemical pathways go on strike. They just simply do nothing. They sit there idle, waiting for that key in the ignition, which is that mineral needed 
to get that thing going. And that can be, that's just why even our detoxification pathways, you know, there's other toxins in the environment, but Roundup tends to damage or inhibit our ability of the cells to detox, NRF2, our ability of the liver to detox, the P450 cytochrome pathways, our ability to of the kidneys to detox. So it becomes the king of, of all of the toxins because it allows all these other toxins to stick around in the body and do damage. That's maybe the most articulate presentation of the impact of glyphosate from that standpoint. And of course, now today uh, in the biohacking world, um, what is the conversation? Well, the conversation is about your microbiome, getting that in good shape. Uh, it's about the mitochondrial function and how disrupted mitochondrial function leads to a variety of metabolic based diseases. But there's a third component here that we need to unpack, which is the genetic impact. So can you talk a little bit about the genetic impact? Maybe it, it, it's Roundup and then maybe genetically modified foods as well. So we can kind of go into that conversation. Absolutely. So when we eat food, it affects our DNA expression. Uh, very often it's the RNA of the foods that we eat that are like little programming things. You can eat some RNA and all of a sudden a cell in your liver begins to express a new protein. Well, when you eat GMOs, or you happen to be a rat, but it works with humans too, there could be hundreds of genes that change their expression. And this is the realm at, of epigenetics for people. Well, actually, who yes, exactly. This is, this is the genes don't change in yes. the rats, but the gene expression changes. Correct. And so turning them on or turning them off is something that food generally did in the past, but the introduction of these elements are potentially accelerating genetic uh, complications or predispositions, or even creating new ones. Would that be a fair argument? Oh yeah, I mean, and the thing is about, what's interesting is epigenetics is inheritable. So on the, both the GMO side, CRISPR, for example, which is a gene editing form of creating a GMO, it inadvertently created a change in protein structure that lasted for at least 10 generations in mice. Never supposed to happen, but there you have it. Another guy I interviewed uh, for my Live Healthy Be Well podcast, he, he injected mice with Roundup and the mice were okay, it was pregnant mice. Their offspring were okay. Grandchildren were messed up. The great grandchildren were the most messed up. 90% had serious problems. He never went to the great great grandchildren, but the great grandchildren were more messed up and so, you know, mothers were dying, the mother rats were dying during, or rats or mice were dying during childbirth. Some of the pups were dying during childbirth, prostate problems, obesity, kidney problems. So it was passed on to future generations. It didn't change the genes, it changed the gene expression. Now, what's interesting is the only human feeding study ever conducted on a currently commercialized GMO, there's hardly any studies that are done. I mean, when you compare what should be done, they found that the Roundup Ready gene that was inserted into soybeans, so allowing the soybean plant not to die when sprayed with Roundup, part of that gene transferred into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines. Now, they didn't continue to see if it was functioning, because if it functioned, this is a horrible concept, because imagine that insecticide producing gene in corn were to transfer to our gut bacteria, it might turn our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories, which might explain why 93% of the pregnant women in Canada tested had this toxin called BT toxin in their blood, because perhaps they were producing it inside their gut bacteria. So there is changes in the DNA in the gut bacteria, and we haven't been able to identify if there's genetic insertion from GMOs into human or animal DNA, we do know the gene expression changes, but we don't know if the gene sequence changes. Right, that's a very clear designation. Well, I think it's, now here's another ask, question I'm gonna ask before we kind of move into the uh, GMO 
conversation. Why do you think there has not been widespread studies onto the complications or contraindications or um, potential challenges amongst the individuals who are consuming genetic modified foods, which in Canada, for example, is a country that we, we, we don't even have the right to know if food has been genetically modified or that was passed by the um, Canadian government not that long ago, which is a pretty tyrannical uh, methodology considering their regulation around health food products and their lack of thereof around quote unquote commercially grown food products. Is this a case of big industry influencing research do- dollars and, and, and government lobbyist groups? I happen to know the answer to this and this because in the 25 years that I've been doing this, I have talked to whistleblowers and scientists and whatnot. And it's a combination of things and it's diabolical. So uh, I'll, I'll use the US as an example, Oh, I could go to Health Canada and talk about it's the Chief Chopra incident and all of that too. But I think we'll stick with the US where it's pretty clear the White House had instructed the FDA to promote GMOs before GMOs were introduced. And so the FDA created a new position specifically for Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor, to be in charge of policy for the agency. And was that he, during the Obama administration? When he, no, when he Obama actually, was, what happened was this was during the first Bush administration. Right. He, he then said, no GMOs, no difference, no testing necessary, no labeling necessary. Then he became Monsanto's vice president. Then he became the U.S. food czar under the Obama administration. So okay, yes, yeah. the second time. Because I knew there was a bunch of Monsantos that came uh, uh, executives that got in on during the. Uh, oh, the, and and during the Bush administration, I mean, they Monsanto created bovine growth hormone, uh-huh. a drug that was injected into cows to increase milk supply. <clears throat> I talked to a former Monsanto scientist. He said three of his colleagues were testing the milk from treated cows. They stopped drinking milk after unless it was organic, they found such a wow. high amount of wow. cancer promoting hormone in the milk. And they said, unless it was organic, the three Monsanto scientists wouldn't drink it, one bought his own cow. So um, in order to approve that, they had Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney on the top. Then we had um, Margaret Mitchell, who was um, formerly a researcher at Monsanto, did research on bovine growth hormone, then took charge of a division of the FDA that evaluated her research. Then Susan Setchin, that had been hired by Monsanto to do the review of RBGH, she became the chief reviewer at the FDA. The, uh, Dr. Richard Burroughs- this is, this, is, this is very similar to Collins reviewing the impact of the NIH and outsourcing its funding to the, uh, to the uh, Wuhan lab in China, which is the oversight for themselves on on where well did they did they actually put you know did yeah, they yeah. Uh, did they create the problem so what we have here is over basically is if if I understand this correctly for our listener because people because a lot of people are ignorant they 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 operate from kind of this naive sense of do gooderism and that hey I wouldn't do. X, Y, Z. Therefore, other people wouldn't do X, Y, Z. And the people on the other side of that equation will do X, Y, Z, and they will hide X, Y, Z from the general public and, and, and leverage their naivete or their goodness as a camouflage through plausible deniability and uh, cherry picked oversight committees and um, being able to kind of navigate through the the change of administrations that happen in democracies is would that be an accurate per- perception of how yeah, but the there, there's even is? more way because I mean, because i mean when you look at the recent roundup trial where monsanto was uh convicted of having their roundup as a contributor to the uh, four plaintiffs that had non-hodgkin's lymphoma they had to turn over millions of documents and it revealed a level of fraud that was so sensational and so rich. I mean, it's something I had been studying, but it was there in black and white. I mean, my name was in there, how they went after me and they called it whack-a-mole. And that, and that was used as an exhibit and mentioned in the closing arguments. So in addition to, and in, like they had their lapdogs at the EPA that were working on their behalf to get, to get their glyphosate declared non-carcinogenic to stop other government research being done 
on that, et cetera. They had front groups. They paid scientists secretly. They hired um, uh, editors of journals who later then retracted other things that were against Monsanto on their on Monsanto's behalf. I mean, it was absolutely fraught with a whole a whole mechanism. They had all these front groups attacking um, when the International Agency for Research on Cancer determined glyphosate was a probable human carcinogen. And they also showed how for decades their research was rigged to avoid finding problems, fraudulently done. And one of the one of the wonderful examples that I like to quote from the trial, which is so typical. I mean, I have a whole section in my second book on how they rigged their research, but this was just perfect. When Monsanto had to see how much Roundup got absorbed into the skin, they took human cadaver skin, applied the Roundup, and more than three times the allowable level was absorbed in. So what they did is they took new human cadaver skin and they baked it in an oven. Then they froze it. Then they applied the Roundup. Hardly any was absorbed. They reported that result without explaining to the EPA that they had baked and frozen the human skin before applying the Roundup. So this is Monsanto's science. <laughs> so what you're saying is that, th and this is something that I think makes a lot of people, like the, di the, bi the bi diabolical nature of this is so deep. <sighs> Because the tenant, the primary tenant of science is to maintain an, an, uh, a perception of skepticism in any theory. And you test a theory and you are able to recreate and re-demonstrate that theory over and over and over again. And you continually retest that as new information comes to light or new testing equipment because you are controlled by, number one, the overall intention, number two, the general amount of knowledge that may be available at a given time. And number three, the testing equipment in order to measure that. And anytime there's a change, at least in the second two of those things, um, then new information might be revealed. Science, science as we know it on the Newtonian paradigm side is, is certainly about causality and you can't measure all of the causal agents that might be involved, but you can do so to a range of predictability that give us the modern world. But what we're talking about here is a change in the intent and in what is called science. And really what you're saying is they're leveraging individuals with scientific credibility, but through some form of um, leverage whether it's uh, incentivizing or it's, you know, public threat, both of which have been reported when dealing with some of these institutions, some sort of threat, whether that's a social threat or a physical threat or a financial threat. I mean, get, getting into a legal fight with a large corporation or, or government agency, right or wrong, usually bankrupts and destroys the lives of those who engage in that just through the economics of maintaining such a fight. But what you're suggesting here is actually a movement away from the scientific method with that, which is we are going to have hypotheses. We are going to test those with the best of the abilities. And we're going to report this in an unbiased nature so that we can make a determination of what the best course of action is. What you're really saying is we are using these people uh, or individuals, maybe with great credibility but taking that data and turning it into a marketing point to move forth their bottom line or whatever other agenda they might have. Would that be accurate? And it's not just taking data, it's sometimes manufacturing it. It's sometimes fraudulently coming up with it using entirely unscientific methods. And when I was writing my first book, Seeds of Deception, I, I wanted the first chapter to be about Dr. Arpad Pustai, one of the world's great scientists in his field. And he had been, he discovered that GMOs were dangerous, that they caused massive damage to rats in just 10 days, uh, potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system. When he went public with his concerns, he ended up being fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit, 
and was just trashed in the public area by Monsanto and the biotech machinery. So I wanted to start my book with what he considered to be his most shocking moment, which is either finding the discovery of how bad GMOs were or being fired from his job. But he was a man of such high scientific integrity. His most shocking moment was actually before all of that had happened, just reading the studies that had gotten GMOs approved in the UK. He said he was supposed to report to the Minister of Agriculture who was doing a, a, a vote in Brussels. So he was given all of the secret documents that had been handed a year earlier to the UK government and no one knew that all these GMOs were approved. So he was handed to it by his boss who was on the approval committee because no one had read it from that committee. They were all committee men. They weren't real scientists in terms of working scientists. So he read it and he had been just working on a, on a $3 million grant from the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. He had 30 people working with him. So he was one of the most qualified humans on earth to evaluate the studies by the biotech industry. He said that was his most shocking moment in his life. He said, you know, poor science, and that was poor science. It was bad. They were doing as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. And none of those things that happened to his rats in just 10 days would ever have been discovered in the flimsy, poor, these are his words, studies that these businesses did, these companies did to get their soybeans on the market in the UK and in the US, etc. So it wasn't it wasn't the scientific method. It was corporate science, checkbook science. It had nothing to do with real science. I remember talking to him about one study where some rats died after being fed genetically engineered tomatoes and they just took them out and said, oh, it wasn't treatment related. And in the middle of the study, they added new rats. He said, Jeffrey, you can't do this. It was like he was pulling his hair out. So, they, I mean, it was it's ridiculous how bad their science is and yet they get away with it because they have tremendous footprint in the academic community. They have a false front situation of scientists and front groups, and they ghostwrite materials. That came out in the documents. They even bragged about ghostwriting, saying, we write it and we pay them to sign it. And it's what explains why Roundup is free from, you know, doesn't cause cancer. Whereas the scientist that they had hired a year earlier says it does. He was one of the world's experts. So they buried his report, never turned it over to the EPA, which was illegal. And then Ghost wrote their own review paper with the opposite conclusions and had others sign it. So, which leads us to the next piece, which is the genetic modification of food and the downstream implications, because we are seeing a widespread First, we saw a widespread distribution of Roundup and, and, and Roundup-friendly crops uh, through controlled uh, seed exposure. So my mom, I'll give you a, a, an easy example. My mom, who is a longtime organic gardener, she started organic gardening when we were a kid. Go mom. We, did, we didn't understand. We thought she was crazy and she wouldn't use chemicals and wouldn't use this. And then, of course, as I went to university, I discovered hey, you know what? I feel better on the food that I have at my mom's house than I do at the university food. And that was my first indication of the difference between, hey, I had a good sense of how I felt and I saw a change. I saw weight gain. Nice. Change. I saw energy gain. I was like, so I'm in one of those rare cases which I had a differentiation factor. I grew in a rural area. We had organic food at the house. My mom was very selective about the food. They did a great job. I'm very blessed at that. And I got to see physiologically the difference. I like, come home from the summer, I would eat the food I, from my mom's place. It might, I felt better. I right. noticed the difference. And then, you know, as I became more and more invested in this topic, of course, I got into microbiomes and these sort of things and started inviting, uh, investigating the impact of genetic modification on food and, and, and GMOs and, you know, them inserting, say, genes from fishes and into tomatoes and, and fly genes into things like so they were not only just it's not like luther burbank taking two different types of tomato to make a better tomato or two different types of potato to make a potato we're talking about taking components and making these chimeric kind of organisms that have never existed before because there's a in evolutionary biology there's a whole 
starting point of the food chain and an ending point of the food chain. And it's all very much interrelated. So when you insert an element, particularly in the bottom part of the food chain, which which we're dealing with microbes, and then even one level below that, and we're dealing with genes, we don't know what the cascading effect could potentially be. Was, is that fair to say? And what evidence do you have that genetically modified foods are, are, are causing problems? You know, it's an interesting question. If you have a Roundup ready crop, is it the Roundup or is it the crop? So Dr. Gilles Eric Serolini, a toxicologist from France, decided to find out. He had been on the evaluation committee for France and also for the EU and had looked at Monsanto's original studies and found that like in Roundup ready corn, there was over 50 irregularities between the experimental group and the control group showing signs of toxicity in the liver and kidneys in just 90 days. So we took the Roundup Ready basic design that, Mar- that um, Monsanto did with the rats and just extended it for two years and then increased some of the uh, parameters to test and found sure enough, right after 90 days, the rats started getting cancer. And by the time two years was over, they had multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage. But in another group, he put Roundup at varying concentrations, different groups, in their water supply and fed them natural corn, not Roundup Ready corn. And they also had multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage. So aha, it's the Roundup. But another group ate the Roundup Ready corn that had no Roundup on it. And they had multiple massive tumors, early death and organ damage compared to the control group that ate normal corn that had a tiny percentage of the tumors and none of that other damage. So it was both the Roundup and the GMO individually and together that led to the problems. Now, we've seen in some of the studies that the GMO itself is causing the problems. They don't do extensive testing, but what we've seen for the testing, it's pretty damning. There's plenty of problems in all of the major major organs and systems, the immune system, the reproductive system, et cetera, just from the GMOs. And there's these potatoes and apples that are engineered not to turn brown when sliced. They use an RNAi technology, an interference RNA, double-stranded RNA, that could literally, theoretically, if you bit the apple, it could reprogram your gene expression, silencing genes in your own DNA. Wow. Similarly with animals and, you know, the animals out there, if they bite the apple or the potato. And now we have gene editing, which also has all sorts of problems. Some scientists say it's even more dangerous than the old style of forcing genes using a gene gun or infiltrating it with bacteria. This gene editing, you don't necessarily take foreign genes in. You do some cutting and rearranging. Within gene editing and in the traditional gene, genetic engineering, you end up with massive collateral damage, hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. With gene editing, the journal Nature described three gene editing, CRISPR gene editing experiments with human embryos. It called it chromosomal mayhem. Large sections of the DNA and the genome were lost, including whole chromosomes, thousands of base pairs gone, rearrangements, massive mutations up and down. So it's not just a precision insertion of a gene that produces a particular protein that you're looking for as the biotech industry portrays it. It is a way of causing unacceptably new types of damage that we have no understanding what the full impact will be, and it's inheritable. What is the trend that we're seeing? Because genetically modified foods have been um, going along quite well. I I would look back to a book called um, Your Your Healing is Voltage by Dr. Tennant. And one of the things that he identified specifically was um, birth defects, birth rates, and um, fertility levels in areas where um, 
genetically modified canola oil was used, used to be called rapeseed at one time. And, and it was, it was so damaging to people. And he showed a correlation between that and it's in, in the States that used it and the States that didn't. And there was uh, a correlational effect to the data and which made him believe from his clinical and medical research that, Hey, we need to start getting the canola oil out of everything. And of course, that was a, a number of years ago. There was a big political push. If people uh, recall, there uh, was during um, maybe eight years ago was during one of the elections. And there was a, a, a viewpoint, the way the wording on the, on the ballot was, was very strange in that it, when you seem like you are advocating for no GMOs, you are actually voting for GMOs. And I remember the day before the election, the editorial piece of every major news outlet in the world was in support of genetically modification, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about massive influential marketing power to get an externalized component. Now, and there, let me let me just add yeah, and say, please. And say about the infertility and the birth of there's plenty of evidence that in the in the vicinity of Roundup being sprayed birth birth defects go up in an area in Argentina it was 70 fold when they started planting Roundup ready soybeans and spraying Roundup from the air by planes. I, in my film, Secret Ingredients, that I did with Amy Hart, we visit a Wisconsin um, chiropractor's office, and she treats a lot of infertile couples, and she puts them all on organic food. And at the time of the, of the film, and since the last time I checked with her, 100% of her infertile couples have children. Wow. Over 100. Over 100 couples. These have been people that were have unable to get kids for sometimes years, had been to infertility clinics, you know, had sometimes they had diagnosed problems, sometimes never diagnosed. But 100% of them had children after she put them on an organic diet, along with the chiropractic. And, but she and I believe the organic diet is the primary driver. And we can look at the specific details of what Roundup and GMOs do to the reproductive health that pro provides plausible causative pathways to explain it all. It's in the film Secret Ingredients, if people want to look at it. So back to you. Uh, where can where can people get that film? Can you just make it? I'd say livehealthybewell.com. Then you can check out my podcast. There's a Healing from GMOs and Roundup series. There's a 90-day lifestyle upgrade that you can do to help you uh, adopt an organic lifestyle, which you'll want to do when you watch Secret Ingredients because we track families that switch to organic and kids on the spectrum are no longer on the spectrum. People with um, obesity and brain fog and skin conditions and cancer, we see a dramatic change. And then the doctors say, these are not one-offs. This is what happens in our practice every day. And then the scientists describe why, and we have nice sh uh, animations showing the changes in the physiology so you can see what happens with GMOs and Roundup. Then you see it in the people, and you hear it by the doctors who see it every day, and then you realize, I need to make a change. You know, it's interesting. One of the striking things I notice, I'm here in Venice Beach, California, and I have the good fortune of being very close to a facility called Irwan, which is a very high-end um, organic grocery market. Yep. Now, this is not a scientific study. This is just... Let me guess. The people who walk in the door are not obese. <laughs> I would say that the distribution of obesity would probably be under 5%. Uh, of, of, the, of the people entering into that place. Now I can go uh, a few miles down the road to uh, a generic, I won't name any grocery stores because I don't want to cause any flame, but you know, it, your generic ones that you see the big chain block wars and stand outside. And I would say that it would be close to the inversion of that where 95% of the people are overweight and a large fraction of those I would classify as clinically obese or morbidly obese. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors, there's economics and stuff. And economics is one of the big factors that are influencing health and longevity studies. So um, a few years, it was always Japan was the healthiest market uh, in the world, even though they have the highest rate of smoking in the most of the, the regular countries, but they had also the highest take of organic food and natural supplementation, which is very interesting. 
but that was recently replaced by a small uh, country called Monte Carlo, <laughs> which the income ratio of is quite high and the advantages that affords uh, maybe better healthcare, medical care, organic products. And when I go to high-end uh, hotels, chains, and so oftentimes they serve organics where they don't at regular hotel chains. If you go to high-end resorts, it's organics. You go to high-end stores, you look at expensive jurisdictions. If you go to Beverly Hills, there's, there's a readily availability of organic foods, but for the general population, it's of a lower quality or, in, and, and the proliferation of subsidies and government funding and things like that, that gets into genetic modified food. The question is, I'm, let's say I'm listening to this. I have a moderate to low income. I have bought into everything you said. I've watched the movies. I want to make the 90 day change. And I encourage all of our, by the way, just so everyone knows, I am hundred percent on board with what Jeffrey is saying here. And so I think it's very clear. And I think when you go through your research, it's very detailed. It's very uh, potent in its uh, clarity. It's, sheer volume and what uh, the, the dire consequences of not engaging in say a reversal of the trend of eating genetically modified or chemically enhanced foods. Or something. So what does a person of moderate means do to move into a more organic lifestyle to say, you know what, I got to get off this food. Number one, what do they eat? How do they live their lifestyle? And then what can they do from an advocacy standpoint? Because it's not enough because we're us, people who are on the organic side of the equation. And I made changes in my life early on when I didn't have economic points. I'm, I'm talking to the audience here. Uh, when, I, I remember um, not having a car. I remember living in a very moderate means and spending a disproportionate amount on my money on my, my food. And people would make fun of me. I would take specialized nutritional supplements. I would do uh, testing. It was obscure according to my... Uh, medical practitioners who I eventually abandoned for uh, functional medicine practitioners. How does a person of moderate or low means make this journey? And, and, and how would they go about that? And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, supercharge your protein shake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein, build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of masszymes into your shake. One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S H A K E. One zero at masszymes.com. That's shake10 at masszymes.com. It's a great question. I'm going to give some tips and tell you where you can get the tips. Um, but I also want to give a psychological orientation to this. I would say combine your health budget with your food budget. Right. A lot of people that we interview after switching to organic go to the doctor less. I interviewed a family, a mother of a family of six. She was spending about $18,000 a year in her health costs per year. She switched to organic. It went to 9,000 the first year and below 3,000 the second year. And she said to me, and I wasn't spending the difference on organic. She was, the return on investment was huge. In addition to your health budget added to your food budget, put your philanthropy budget there too, because you're also making a contribution to a healthier world, healthier farmers, healthier microbiome. We'll get into the microbes in a moment. That's the psychological orientation so that you can feel good about the investment into your health, into your future, and into the planet. I was also wondering about how can people afford when they don't have a lot of money 
to eat organic and eat and or to eat without GMOs and Roundup in their food. If you can't eat organic, and a lot of times it's not available in your area, you want to at least avoid the GMOs, and you can go to responsibletechnology.org for our Institute for Responsible Technology website, and it tells you which of the GMOs. But in addition, they spray Roundup now on oats just before harvest and wheat just before harvest and the beans and the legumes like lentils and chickpeas and stuff. So some of those have very high levels of Roundup if it's not organic. So if you're going out to eat and there's no organic food and you want to eat there, you don't want to order oatmeal. You'd want to try and avoid the bread. Don't get the hummus or the lentils or the mung beans because they're going to have a lot of Roundup in it. So if you go to our website, responsibletechnology.org, we also have a report gathering all the data of all the residues of Roundup that have been found by our organization and other organizations around North America, US and Canada. So you can figure out pretty quickly which foods you don't want to eat unless it's organic. So you can avoid the GMOs on the one side and those that have been sprayed with Roundup on the other. But then there are tricks once you want to adopt an organic uh, lifestyle. So I interviewed the, a person who was an organic farmer who runs a distribution company around the United States. He's got 2,500 drop points for little group buying groups. And he said he figured out that when he feeds his family of five or six a dinner or a breakfast, he figured out it was like $1.37 per person for a completely organic meal. And he explains how to do it. In the film, um, Kathleen DeKiar says, I can feed my family of five an all organic meal for 20 bucks or for less than 20 bucks. And she explains how. So first of all, and I'll give you a few of those points, but we actually ask most of the people in the film who are way up on the learning curve of how to live an organic lifestyle, how to save time and how to save money. And they're, they're brilliant ideas. But one is learning to cook. So if you just take, if you're just eating processed foods that are not organic, that's expensive. If you substitute processed organic for your processed non-organic, now you're going to pay probably more and you're, it's, it's going to have some benefit, of course, it's not going to have the GMOs or the Roundup. But if you learn to cook and you can buy things in bulk, et cetera, and if you learn to cook, your price may actually go down per meal from a processed conventional or uh, chemical food to a cook from scratch organic. Now, how do you have time for that? That's a whole reel we did, a whole series of interviews which we put together. The, you know, the, the woman that runs that chiropractic office that's very busy during the week, she gets together with six other moms and they have a great party every Sunday and they cook seven entrees and then they all freeze stuff for the week and then they meet again for the next the next time. You know, there's different there's different tricks for different folks, and a lot of them are represented in that 90 day program. But the key is, it has to be worth it for you to try. Now, in the film Secret Ingredients, we have a number of doctors saying that when their patients change their diet and their autoimmune disease goes away, or their pain, their joints pain goes away, or otherwise, they'll they'll be on that diet for a while, and then they'll cheat. They'll go on vacation or they'll some, for some it's a single meal. For some it's like they just go through dietary fatigue and they stop. Then their symptoms come back. And the doctors were so excited about that. They were like beaming because that was more motivational to their patients because their patients saw without a doubt it was the diet that was driving those symptoms. And because they didn't want that pain and because they didn't want those that autoimmune disease or whatever, they became more steadfast in their diet. So the motivation may drive someone who doesn't really want to cook to learn how to cook. And we have some tips and we have a whole program for getting comfortable with that. But yes, there's a learning curve, but the first piece is motivation. So I would say the first thing to do is watch Secret Ingredients. And I did with Amy Hart. You can go to livehealthybewell.com and then make the decision what to do. Because when you see the changes in the people that had, you know, there's one family, the DKRs, they had 21 chronic conditions between the five of them. 
She started studying nutrition. She lost her job. She was paralyzed, etc. So she started studying nutrition and started experimenting on the family and got rid of gluten and soy and dyes and commercial dairy and whatnot. And they were getting better from a bunch of things, but she was still managing 21 chronic conditions until they switched to organic. And then in very little time, they all went away. And she was the inspiration for doing the film. And we interviewed her because I was at a, I speak at medical conferences. I was at a chiropractic conference. And I said from the, from the podium, if you have some good stories, come. So we interviewed her and it was, oh, we got to go to her house and interview her. Then the next person coming in was Dr. Marsha Schaefer, who had, at the time, 53 infertile couples that ended up with kids. Last time I spoke to her was 123. And it was like, you know, these are real life situations. I remember the first time a doctor, I've been speaking about GMOs to medical conferences since 2006. And I have to admit, it's a little embarrassing that people would come up to me and say, I can tell the difference. And I didn't believe him at the time. I was talking about rat changes and mice changes, but I wasn't quite thinking it was going to be that overt. So I started telling the doctors about it. They started prescribing non-GMO and organic diets. When I went back to those same conferences to speak, those doctors said it works. Thousands of patients I've put on organic or non-GMO and they all get better. They all show a change and things happen that are not happening to the population that's not making the change. It's a, it's a powerful case. And, and I love the fact that you're providing the impetus of change. And, you know, I'm a, I, I have my, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't show, but I have my Jordan Peterson shirt on today. And it says, uh, clean your room, tell your truth, you know, <laughs> order out of chaos. And one of the, the tenets that he's put forth is that um, clean up your own house before you go out and clean up everyone else's. And I think one of the things that I've noticed with the best advocates within the industry for um, non-GMO, non-chemical uh, organic food is the best ones are following those tenants themselves. And there's a level of um, truth and, and expression of truth that resonates. In other words, there's a clarity of communication. There's no distortion between what they're advocating, what they're saying and inside. And I think for a lot of people they want in today's world, there's a lot of virtue signaling. In other words, the, Hey, I'm going to put a post about this. I'm going to put a post about my opi political opinions while rec not recognizing where or, or the environment, let's say, an environmental issue. While I'm doing this on my petroleum-based phone with my lithium batteries, which are from the most environmentally in front of the phone that's built with a, by, by in an area where we're having major human rights thing, but I can do my I could do my post about the, this, mm -hmm. this like, mm -hmm. you know. So the question becomes, I guess, because what you're saying for many can be overwhelming. So if you could walk people through the steps that you feel is, is for lack of a better word, an organic way to take control of this method, because what you're suggesting oh, yeah. is a threat to all of humanity, essentially. Well, we haven't even talked about the existential threat from GMO What's microbes. It? I'm oh. waiting for, I'm like- Okay, let's, let's, let's hit it. Let's get, let's get right now. We're going to the existential threat. I, I know that um, Eric, uh, excuse me, um, Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather, who are evolutionary biologists. They have a beautiful podcast called Dark Horse Podcast. It is absolutely excellent. They are what I would call definitive, um, hardcore scientists that look at data. They have a level of skepticism. They don't rush to conclusions. But as an evolutionary biologist, and his brother is a super genius in physics, uh, Eric Weinstein, he also has another podcast, He's come to the conclusion, uh, Brett has and his wife, that it's about a 50-50 chance, a coin flip, whether humanity is going to erase itself from the planet. I think that's, and, and, and he's not someone that is into hyperbole, okay? So you hear hyperbole on the news, the sky's falling, the end of the world, all that sort of stuff. But what you're talking about here is an existential crisis. Can you explain why you feel that is the case Okay. And why your message is so urgent for people to not only embrace in their own lives, but to embrace ad advocacy to stop the insanity before it's too late. So I'm going to give a website and I'll mention it again at the end. So if your people are driving or whatever, 
You can get it at the end. ProtectNatureNow.com. Mm-hmm. And if you go there, there's three things I'm going to suggest in terms of advocacy. The first is watch the 16-minute film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. Then go to the advocacy platform and then make some for, sort of continuing monthly donation to allow us to work on your behalf to save, to tip that percentage so that we have more than a 50% chance. Because as you'll hear in a minute, this is one of the existential threats that can take us out. In the film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, I interview Dr. Elaine Ingham. When she was at Oregon State University, one of her graduate students was getting his PhD and wanted to do some research on GMOs. And there was a group of people creating a GMO bacterium, well-meaning people that was going to have a great impact on farms. You'll see this in the film where this is a bacterium that normally exists on the root structures of every plant in the planet. And they had genetically engineered it so that it would create alcohol, turning plant matter into alcohol. So they were going to send it out to all these farmers who normally burn their crop residues after harvest. Said, no, no, mix it in a big barrel, put the bacterium in, and then two weeks later, open the spigot at the bottom, you left 34 proof alcohol, run your tractors, sell it off farm, and use that nutrient rich sludge at the bottom as fertilizer. Well, it turns out this graduate student was invited by these researchers to now you, you can use, you can look at our organisms and he mixed it with soil and planted wheat seeds compared to the, the clubs compared to two different controls. And on a Saturday morning, he came into the laboratory and was shocked because all of the plants that had the genetically engineered bacteria mixed into their soil were dead. It had turned the plants into slime. Now it turns out that if they had released this genetically engineered bacterium into the environment and it spread, if it had taken over the biological niche of its natural counterpart, it could theoretically turn all the roots in the world to slime. I asked Elaine Ingham, I said, what would be the consequence of releasing this outdoors? She said, the end of biology, the, the end of terrestrial plant life is possible. That's from one microbe doing what it was designed to do, and it was supposed to be released two weeks later. And how far would it spread? Whistleblowers at the EPA told Dr. Ingham they had released a different genetically engineered microbe bacteria in Louisiana and found that within several years, it had traveled around the world. They found it everywhere they looked. So put the two together, we may have narrowly avoided a cataclysm. Genetically engineered bacterium designed to turn a particular bacteria that normally creates rain, creates frost, creates snow, make it impotent. If they had released that as planned, it might have changed weather patterns on the planet. Again, a microbe doing what it was intended to do, but maybe too well. But if we release genetically engineered microbes, they can travel the planet. We didn't need a pandemic to know that microbes can travel. We didn't need a pandemic to know that they can mutate. So now you have a genetically engineered microbe that's introducing a new trait into a microbiome balanced nature outside us and inside us, doing something that was never intended that did not co-evolve with nature or our bodies. But it doesn't stop there. It also swaps genes with other microbes, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands. So you introduce a genetically engineered microbe in your laboratory and you release it to a particular ecosystem to do a particular job and it mutates and it swaps genes and it ends up in a thousand different microbes in 10,000 ecosystems and inside the human body doing things that you can never predict. Now we take the importance of the microbiome We've said this earlier, 80% of the diseases, chronic diseases, have their source in an imbalance in the microbiome. And you take a particular gene, like just to give you just how fine-tuned this system is, 
and the second trimester of human pregnancy, milk digesting bacteria go into the birth canal to inoculate the baby to digest the breast milk. The breast milk also has microbiome inoculation. The skin on the nipple has microbiome inoculation. And there's part of the breast milk is not designed to be digested by the baby. It is indigestible by the baby because it's designed to feed the microbiome because when the microbiome is in good shape early, it sets that person up for health for the rest of their life and then to the next generation. In fact, when there are problems with the health of the baby, it affects the saliva microbiome, which then feeds back through the breast to the mother, which changes the formula, right? Now, you take something along that line or the lines of the bacteria that help prevent the spread of breast cancer or the bacteria that help give us IQs in the brain. You know, there's, these are very real programming genetics. And you take something that's been there for thousands of years and you change it in some way accidentally. You may be creating, destroying the nature of nature, causing a damage or collapse of ecosystems inside us or outside of us. Now, there's two more pieces you need to know. One, gene editing is so cheap and easy, you can genetically engineer microbes in a do-it-yourself kit on Amazon for $169. Yeah. As a biohacker, you can build your own laboratory for under $2,000 and for the price of dinner. Each day, you can create a new genetically engineered microbiome and take it for a walk and have an irreversible, permanent environmental release. Multiply that by all of the garage labs, the high school biology labs, the college labs, the, school, the, the corporations, the academia, and within the next generation, you may have a million different genetically engineered microbes introduced on this planet. And the regulation is look the other way. That's the official regulation. It's as if there's no problem. There's very, very few structures available anywhere that have any form of even evaluation. And all of those are too superficial to make a meaningful dent in this flood of what could end up being the end of biological evolution as we know it. Today, we are reeling from the pandemic. So everyone's all about viruses and right. microbes. There is a receptor cells. We said there are receptor cells that are open in the human consciousness right now about this issue. So we are finding that people in Congress are concerned. People around the world are concerned. It is when you watch the 16 minute film, don't let the gene out of the bottle. You get it. It's not hard. It's not difficult to understand the problems. And so now we every month we load a different campaign into the advocacy platform. So you put your address and whether you live in the United States or Canada, UK, EU, Australia, your elected officials show up. You hit send and they get a film or a white paper or a, an article about some aspect of this each month. Takes you a couple of minutes because you can also tweet them. You can also send a press release to your local or regional papers press of a button, or you can customize the message. And we've sent tens of thousands of messages and it's working. I was just in DC last month and meeting at the offices of members of Congress, they were all over this. And then at the same time, when you go to protectnaturenow.com and you watch the film and you go to the advocacy, play, advocacy play page, please go to the donate page and make a recurring monthly donation. Even if it's $5, whatever it is, because it's monthly, we know it's coming and we can hire and we can create new educational assets. We can open new offices because we know we can count on it because we need to, we need to be the micro whisperers here. They don't have their own voice. We need to feel into the fact that they are the micro Jedi army working on our behalf 24 seven everywhere on the planet. And they're under attack right now from our folly, from our mistakes, from our not appreciating the nature of nature. So we need to protect nature now. And that is why after 25 years of talking about the health dangers of GMOs, I've taken our Institute for Responsible Technology and we're pivoting now and putting our main attention in passing laws 
to prevent the outdoor release of any GMO microbe. And that's our focus today. Very strong words and very important ones, I might add. Um, before we wrap up, and we're going to put up, by the way, for all our listeners, definitely go through all the show links. We've got all the connections to the films, uh, the books, and the advocacy plans where you can donate. All those things It's very, very important that you take action, action, action. Um, it's great to get information, but it's actionable. As dark and challenging and um, almost hopelessly daunting that this situation presents to our listeners and to yourself as someone who's studied it and understood that what's the what's the positive side of the equation what like what gets you up is 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 there a world that you see on the other side of this which humanity moves past genetic modification moves past uh, overt chemicalization and this type of thing. And what does that world look like? I am way optimistic, Wade. First of all, <clears throat> focusing on the GMO health dangers, I was pioneering the messaging and trying to get at least 5% of the US population to avoid eating GMOs, which would create economic pressure on those companies that had their product sitting next to a non-GMO labeled product. product so that they would become non-GMO simply for economic sustainability and protecting their, their market share. We now have 51% of the US population thinking that GMOs are unsafe, more than we need, 48% around the world. So we are in the middle of the tipping point. We are succeeding, tremendous success in 25 years, tremendous. And when I look at this situation now with the existential threat, we have just at the time when the technology is available, we have the pandemic which sensitizes us, and we have the awareness of the importance of the microbiome inside of us, because of the 50,000 studies that have been published in the last five years, just on the human microbiome alone. It's an overwhelming flood of evidence showing that this is an essential part of our health. But you know when the, you've talked to people who were facing a crisis situation, and that caused them to make a change and see life different, and they look back at that crisis as a blessing. So we are now at a situation where the earth is hitting a wall or not, and we have to make a change. Now, that change turns out to be a more fundamental shift where we get to think about nature differently. We get to think about being stewards and protectors of nature. We realize that we now have arrived at the inevitable time in human civilization where we can redirect the streams of evolution instantly and for all time, irreversibly. And that with that become, comes a new responsibility. And that it's for our very existence we have to redefine our role. For our very future and the future of humanity, we have to step up as protector and as steward, which is our appropriate role, especially now that we have this technology that can affect all living beings and all future generations. And from an individual standpoint, because we are now curbing and protecting all living beings and all future generations, we're doing more good than any previous human could do because there was never a level of threat that had that footprint. So it becomes our honor, not our burden, but our honor to do this, our honor to use this time to help tweak and change and deliver a new awareness for humanity, which can give us a lot more return on our investment than just protecting the microbiome, because when we understand that the nature of nature is precious and is awesome and is part of our health, our future, and our legacy, then we can gain a lot more benefit from that new relationship, and we will be the drivers. Beautifully said. Uh, I had a, during a recent meditation, 
Um, I saw my single life as a single cell in the human body or the organism of humanity throughout all of time. In other words, tens of thousands of generations before and tens of thousands of generations to go beyond. And from that perspective, one can make sense of what appears to be a chaotic world. I guess it comes down to intent. What is the intent and how aligned you can stay to your intention when you come face to face with a fallible mind? Our, all our minds are fallible to a certain extent. We believe things that we think are true and are not true. We are presented with situations where we are in alignment with our values or we're not in alignment of your values. And um, what are the incentives are um, to advance one's life or to preserve it as we're seeing. It would seem that humanity right now is in an existential crisis. And that is with the injection of radical technological innovation, which has happened in the last century, essentially, since the 1900s really was the explosion with electricity and trans communication across great vast distances and in the interconnectivity of humans and the explosion of the human population, largely in part to medical science that allowed this explosion to happen. And then the complications from compromised medical science, science moving away from its original intentions to preserve and protect life. Do you see that these existential drivers are actually evolutionary pressures to a, to a, a newer level of consciousness, a new understanding, this new world, or are they just, catastrophic in nature and uh, hopeless you know the flexibility of the human spirit is remarkable as is the diversity of experience of humans on earth um i do see it as catalytic i do see even the the pandemic shutdown as an interesting um shift towards a phase transition I remember asking people two or three months into the shutdown, even two, even a month into it, what's the best thing you've noticed about this? And they say, well, I, I realize based on my lifestyle now that when I go back out there, I need to make a change. I need to, I need to up level. And in a chemical um, titration curve, you drop chemicals in, Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then the phase transition happens and then it levels out. The quality of the drops at the first flat stage make no difference. The quality of the drops at the last stage make no difference. The quality of the drops during the tra phase transition determine how much the transformation occurs. That we see as, a, as an advocate and activist you can work real hard to get someone to want to make a change and they're resistant, they're resistant. And finally they say, okay, I want to make a change. The quality of the information there is all important because that's going to determine what they're going to do. Are they just going to avoid GMOs? Are they going to avoid Roundup? Are they just going to like, you know, take a vitamin? And that becomes their new normal. The information during the phase transition when they're actually making the change is critical. So I created a program called the Magnificent New Normal for that to help people get the right information during this time. But what I see is that this time now, has, people are, we need to make a change. We need to make a change. It is absolutely critical because the pandemic and these existential threats have done the heavy lifting to get us to the point where people are saying, yes, I will change. That's the point we wait for as activists, as global educators. That's the point where we get to celebrate with a new relationship with the people we're talking to so that they establish the highest level of transformation. So I see both the pandemic and the existential crises that we're facing as shifting to an openness and a readiness and a curiosity and a motivation that it's now those of us that have information to give with you giving your information, me giving my information, those of us that have been studying and feel confident that what we have is important, 
it is a critical time to insert that into humanity. I also feel like human systems like natural systems all over are not linear and non-local. They operate as systems. Phase transitions happen in metal, turning them into magnets, happen in the heart, turning the pacemaker cells into a whole beating heart. I think there's a leap possibility with human consciousness also. And it doesn't mean we need 51% of the population to line it because that's not how phase transitions work in nature. It's usually a lot less. So the capacity for a small number of people aligning themselves with high quality information at a time when the whole civilization is ready to make a change. Yes. I think this is an evolutionary time. Amazing. Where can people reach you, connect with you, follow your information, and more importantly, take action in their own life? We have two different lists. We have the Protect, we have the Protect Nature Now, Institute for Responsible Technology. Those are responsibletechnology.org, protectnaturenow.com. And then we have the Live Healthy, Be Well podcast and Secret Ingredient movie and all that. So I would say get both one is one the live healthy be well is like what can you do to <clears throat> heal from the impacts of gmos and roundup detox rebuild repair the body because that's what people want when they say yes to the to life in a new way and then the other one is more advocacy and a lot of science and you know contacting your your local or, or your elected officials etc there you have it folks jeffrey smith on the cutting edge of the understanding of our role with genetically modified foods, um, chemical agents with impact our microbiome and an avenue to express yourself in a responsible way. As we move through this phase shift uh, humanity is facing right now, the challenges you face today are oftentimes the invitations to find the greatness within yourself. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank all of our listeners. If you like that, you smash it, share it. But more importantly, take action. Don't just listen to it. Go in there. Uh, donate to the cause. Start taking the 90-day program yourself. Implement the changes because once you've implemented change within yourself, you become change in the world. And that is a little bit of a paraphrase on one of my heroes, Mahatma Gandhi, who illustrated a tremendous amount of change in his life. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jeff. Really appreciate it. And uh, best wishes for you in this mission. It's a great and noble cause. And I really appreciate your commitment to it. Thank you for joining us today on the Awesome Health Podcast. Thank you, Wade. And safe eating, everyone. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.